Hello, within, and thanks for watching this special edition of Next Play Live. Now, this year's show usually focuses on athletes who transition to second careers away from sports, whether they're small business owners, tech investors, or public speakers. But during these next couple of weeks, we're going to have a specific focus on players who have transitioned from sports to a career in medicine and are fighting on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our guest today is Dr. Myron Rowling. His path began towards a career in medicine at Florida State University, where he both graduated with a degree in exercise science and earned All-American honors while playing football. In November 2008, he made national news after arriving late to a game in Maryland. The reason? He was in Birmingham, Alabama earlier that same day, completing an interview for a Rhodes Scholarship. After earning the scholarship, Rhodes studied medical anthropology at Oxford University in England, where he trained for the 2010 NFL Draft. And during that draft, he was selected by the Tennessee Titans. Years later, he left behind his career in football to enroll at Florida State's College of Medicine. Here you can see a photo of him uh, opening his match day letter. Today, he is a neurosurgeon resident at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, where he has contributed to an all hands on deck approach to fighting the pandemic. Welcome to the show, our guest, Myron Roll. Thanks for having me. All right. so. We could just get to that last point right then and there. This all hands on deck approach, we've heard stories about doctors shifting focus to help with the surge of patients that have been infected by COVID-19. Can you describe to us what that process is like when you have to change course? It's a challenging uh, process, certainly. You know, I signed up to be a neurosurgery resident, a neurosurgeon uh, who deals with brain, spine, complex pathology, peripheral nerve disease. And when COVID-19 hit, I hit Boston very hard. And our hospital, Mass General, is one of the best hospitals, if not the best hospital in the country, but we're certainly a major hub for New Hampshire and Maine and Connecticut, Vermont, uh, all these New England states. So we're getting flooded with patients coming into the emergency department off the street with COVID-19. And so we needed more person power. We needed more manpower to help staff and manage these patients. Our critical care doctors, our infectious disease and anesthesiologists, they were running the show. But they asked for people like myself and others who are neurosurgery residents, OB-GYN residents, dermatologists, whoever, to join the fight, help be redeployed and redistributed around the hospital uh, to help in this fight. And so it was a change. It transformed our hospital tremendously. We slowed down on all the operations we were having. Uh, you know, we, we had elective procedures pretty much canceled. We were only doing emergency procedures. And our outpatient clinics were all done virtually where we were calling our patients rather than seeing them in person. So it was a transformative experience, one that we all learned from, but we got together, uh, we, we stuck it out. And um, I think the patients benefited because we've seen COVID sort of slowly come down and our hospital return to a little bit of sense of normalcy. And I think that's all related to the proactive measures uh, that were done by our administration and team uh, at our hospital. So when I think about you uh, illustrating this experience, I think about if someone asks you to play a different uh, position on a football field. You might know some things because you are a football player, but there are probably some functions that you're not used to doing day to day. So what are some of the things that you really weren't doing that often that you had to start doing because you were dedicated to this fight? Well, that's correct. That link is, is very, very valid. Uh, you know, I, I obviously deal with brains and the central nervous system all the time, spines as well, peripheral nerves as I mentioned. I know those things very well in and out. Uh, obviously still training and getting my hands right so I can continue to be a good surgeon in the operating room and have good results. But these things I study and I, I know it, I see it. Uh, but when you have to deal with acute respiratory distress syndrome and intubation, cloning a patient, because COVID-19, you know, has a propensity for hitting uh, the alveoli, the angiotensin converting enzyme spaces like the lung. It sits there, it incubates, and then eventually it creates this cytokine storm where you end up having sort of a hyper- inflammatory response and, and that causes some respiratory issues so learning about oxygen saturation and learning about you know like i said cloning patients that allow their lungs to expand better and getting the proper scan to make sure you're getting the right consulting services to see these patients infectious disease as well all of these things are new uh, but thankfully we weren't doing this alone we weren't isolated in a silo in, on an island uh trying to manage these patients you know just on a whim we had wonderful instructors uh, attendings of, like I said, emergency departments, critical care doctors, intensivists, um, anesthesiologists who really help guide this process. And yes, uh, having to be flexible and having to uh, adapt 
Um, I learned that through football, you know, having to change positions and do different things and have different responsibilities. But at the end of the day, the goal is to win. On the football field, and the goal is to get these patients healthy and get them back to their families. And uh, that's what we try to do. Uh, and just a reminder for everybody who's uh, just joining us, we're here with Dr. Myron Rule, former NFL player and current neurosurgery resident at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Thank you to Monique from Miami, Rob and Raleigh, Benjamin from Texas. Thank you to everybody that's joining in today. Uh, Myron, I want to go back to 2008 because I think that's when your story really hit the national scene. So I remember, uh, you know, uh, ESPN, all, all the coverage that there was dedicated to you at that time because of the unique experience of becoming a road scholar and then going to play a game that same day. I remember you saying that you had a police escort after that interview to go back from Birmingham to College Park. Do you remember what you were thinking at that time as you were boarding the plane? <laughs> to be honest, I was thinking, can I eat some food? Uh, the whole day, I, I didn't eat. I was so nervous. I was anxious. You know, there was so much going on, so many emotions that were hitting. You learn that you win the Road Scholarship that same day. You take the interview uh, in front of maybe about six or seven people who are former Road Scholars, uh, and then they tell you uh, if you are one of the two people selected in that specific region. So I didn't eat. I was nervous. My teammates were checking in with me, seeing how I was doing. I was checking in with them to see where they were along in their um, – their pregame ritual. Uh, so Birmingham obviously is a long way away from College Park, Maryland. So uh, once I learned that I won, and then I had to do interviews from the media, I had to get a police escort, as, as we mentioned. Uh, thankfully, the NCAA allowed us to have a private plane uh, to fly directly from Birmingham to College Park so I can get there on time. But yeah, I was thinking about food in my belly, and I was thinking about how could I, you know, have an impact in this game because you know I was an All-American on the field and a leader and a captain on my team. And I wanted to make sure that I was able to contribute. But as soon as I got there, uh, my teammates were so proud of me. And it was a great day, a remarkable day for me, my family, student athletes around the country as well. So let's talk about the actual experience that led to you being there. Because it all seems to start from being just an ambitious student, an ambitious athlete um, in the first place. We all know that athletes are on the borderline of being pro athletes when they're in college because there's these ambitious schedules, high-profile games. But yet you're also on this pre-med track, completing your degree um, early. Uh, what was the most difficult part of not only balancing the ambition on, in the football field, but also the ambition to not only excel academically, but excel rapidly? Well, a lot of that started from my family and my parents. You know, we came from the Bahamas. We're from Azuma, Bahamas, a uh, small park, roll town. There's Bullville, there's Stevenson, Barry Terry. These are the settlements that my family comes from. And, uh, we moved permanently to the United States, specifically New Jersey, uh, when I was very young. And so my parents knew that coming over here, this was a, a place with an abundance of resources that had limitless opportunities and no ceiling on our growth if we maximize our potential. If we developed a firm foundation of education, and we were true to being Christian and good leaders. And so I developed this sort of uh, time management and, and skill that allowed me to sort of balance being an athlete and being a student, being a student and being an athlete. These two things. Uh, could be compartmentalized in my body. And I did that by being disciplined, focused, and staying away from distraction. Started that in high school. Went to a boarding school in Princeton, New Jersey, and it was almost like a mini college. I mean, you had to wake yourself up, iron your clothes, you had to do your study hall, you had to go to practice. All of these things sort of worked for me. And I just kept that regimen on when I got to, to, to college because I knew that I had to do more beyond football. I knew football was going to take me far, but eventually it was going to stop. And then eventually I had to move on to another track and have significant impact on the world some kind of way. For me, it was medicine through neurosurgery, through healing with my hands, hopefully, and my brain, uh, you know, people were allowed me to do that. So uh, it was difficult, certainly, uh, but I think it was something that I was used to. And I, I made it a habit. I made it routine. And I didn't look at it like a burden. I looked at it like, hey, this is what is the cost to uh, try to accomplish your goal. And so we're getting some comments in the stream right now. Thank you to Stephen, who says, all of us Knowles are proud of you, Myron. Obviously, Knowles being the mascot of Florida State. We have Shakir, who says, this is incredible. So happy to be hearing from such accomplished people of color. We have Andrew, who commented, Dr. Roll, as a high school kid, I remember watching your story and being inspired in awe that it was possible to excel in so many areas. Again, as we mentioned before, uh, part of that uh, excellence was uh, becoming a Rhodes Scholar, but you were also training uh, to enter the NFL draft at the same time. I'm not only curious about how you were doing both at the same time, but also you're doing this while you're in London. It's not, they're not people who are specialized in training NFL players just walking around the street, I would imagine. What was that process like? What was your day-to-day -day like during that year? 
yeah, the Rhodes Scholarship was an amazing opportunity. I earned my medical anthropology master's degree uh, right at Oxford and uh, specifically at St. Edmund Hall, Teddy Hall, it's affectionately called. I brought my brother with me and that helped me. My older brother, McKinley, he's a high school football coach and my best friend. Uh, we've been training and running on the boardwalks of Atlantic City since we were boys and back home in the beaches of the Bahamas. This is my man. And uh, I brought him with me to help train me. He brought uh, a weight vest and jump ropes and had all the drills ready for me at football. And he had some players come out so I can cover them, you know, as if I was a defensive back. And, and I, I, I destroyed them because, honestly, the Brits can't really play football that well. They can play soccer well, but not American football. And, uh, yeah, so I did that. I tried to keep my mind sharp by watching game film. I had my coaches from Florida State send me some films so I can you know, continuously uh, go through my, my head as far as my reads and my, my blitzes and my zone coverages. And then I came back to the States just for a second. I would hop in and hop out. I went to uh, the Senior Bowl, played in Mobile, Alabama, and did well there. Got my name back on the radar, showed, showed up in great shape. And uh, the NFL scouts said, okay, here's my role. He's back. Went to the Combine, did well there. Had a pro day, did well. So I tried to stay in shape and do all the things I could. So that I had one foot in America doing the NFL, you know, pre-draft sort of things, and then one foot in Oxford learning about, you know, post-colonial stigmatization, gender role, and how all these things intersect with medical anthropology. So it was two hats, a balancing act for sure. But I will say, none of this is done alone. I got a great guy, and I have great family members and friends who help buttress and support. This network help help support me, and they know that I had this mission. They know that I have this goal. Uh, and they helped me get there for sure. I remember one last thing I'll say before I before I stop on this point. Uh, you know, when I went to Florida State University and I was an undergrad, you know, I had teammates who are from Opelika, Florida, or you know, Polk County, Florida, very you know rough neighborhoods you would say traditionally. Uh, and they were the main breadwinners for their family. They were they were going through challenging times, and they came from the street. Honestly, let's be honest, they came from the street. And sometimes those habits that they had from their home life will come to FSU. And so when I wanted to go and hang out with them because they're my boys and my teammates and my friends, a lot of times those guys would push me off and say, no, no, you're going to be a doctor one day. You're going to be president one day. You got, you, you, you're going far. You can't be here with us doing what we're doing. And I, at first I said, yeah, why? Why would you push me away? But then I said, you know what? They care about me. They care about my journey. They're trying to protect me. And I've had people like that in my life. You know, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. And it matters. It certainly matters to have that sort of uh, influence and that support system. Um, I mean, we should actually uh, stay on that point because, uh, you know, while you were at Florida State, the legendary coach Bobby Bowden, uh, before he retired, he referred to you as a model student athlete. But uh, a couple of years later, when you were speaking before con uh, Congress, you made a clear distinction between your experience and the experience of people like the friends that you were just talking about right now. I want to read a quote that you said. A lot of them would go through the, the academic machinery and be spit out at the end of that machine. Why would you say that? It, it, it's true. You know, I, I think sometimes when you enter some of these major Division One football programs, it's not unique to Florida State. You know, I love my alma mater. It's a great place, but I'm going to be very truthful when I say that sometimes these guys were coming in with the only mindset of getting to the NFL right? because they knew that if they got there, if they were able to achieve that goal. They can provide for their family, their family's family, their friends. They can take care of the people who took care of them growing up. And this is their goal. And so if, th if this was the push that they were sort of putting on to themselves, going into school. Sometimes the schools have a way to create a corridor for you uh, that, um, you know, uh, allows you to sort of escape through without you know, really being challenged intellectually, challenged civically, challenged socially, challenged emotionally. Uh, you really only get challenged on the field, uh, and that becomes your, your main priority. So uh, my experience is different because, you know, I made it clear and evident to Coach Bobby Bowden that I wanted to be a student athlete with the word student coming first. And he honored that. He allowed me to go to labs. He allowed me to apply for the Rhodes Scholarship. He allowed me to do mentoring in Tallahassee, the Big Bend area in Florida. He allowed me to go in the, to meet the governor, Charlie Chris, Jeb Bush. You know, he, he allowed me to do these things. And he would allow the other players to do it as well. But it's also a, a, a very much, a much easier pathway that guys can go. And uh, it's unfortunate because at the end of it all, once football ends, because it does for everyone, it's sometimes left looking at what do I do? Where do I go? What did that college experience do for me? except, you know, uh, expose and exploit my athletic talent. Uh, I didn't really get anything back from it. So I, I think that's the point I was trying to make in that, uh, you know, Senate hearing that I did um, a couple of years ago and, and still range true today. Mm. So now let's fast forward to your NFL career. You play a couple of years in the league. You obviously, like, literally are the only person in the league at that time who has both 
I guess the option to be playing as a football player and the option to be going to medical med school. There's a couple of others who do, who do the same. How do you come to the decision to leave one lifelong passion for another? Because we've seen you say that you were thinking about becoming a doctor since you were young, but obviously you were playing football when you were young. What is coming to that decision like? It's hard, I'll be honest. It's very difficult uh, because football is so intertwined in everything that you do, what you eat, where you go, uh, when you sleep, who you hang with, what you wear, when you wake up. I mean, it really defines all facets of your person. And so to say, I'm going to stop that and then I'm going to jump onto something else, it's a difficult transition, even for someone like myself who prepared for this second chapter. I, I was ready for this second chapter in my mind, basically. But for the guys who don't, imagine the spiral downward that they go, the depression that they go through. When the cheers are gone, the money's gone, the acclaim is gone, you know, the walking VIP, the first class treatment that you get as an NFL player, and that's all gone. How do they try to find their identity? It's so attached to the sport. So for me, it was as well, unequivocally. But um, again, I leaned on my family and I leaned on my friends and I leaned on prayer uh, and, and, and introspection to say, you know what? I'm healthy. I can leave this game with my hands in order, uh, with no concussions, uh, with enough money practically to pay for medical school. Let me go on and, and do something that can last for a longer time and maybe have a, a deeper, more indelible impact going and trying to fix someone's brain tumor or change someone's spinal deformity or go overseas and you know, assist hydrocephalus and young post infectious kids to uh, grow up in low to middle income countries. You know, that's certainly a, a goal of mine. So uh, it, was, it was a tough transition. It took about a month or two to really sort of shake it off of me. Uh, but once I did, it was full steam ahead medicine and I'm glad I did it. Um, we have some questions coming in. Thank you to Stuart, Jesse, Michelle, uh, Caroline, Stephanie for all adding your questions. But before we get to those, I actually want to go back to a point that you just mentioned right now, which is money. You're playing among the elite of the elite athletes. It's very cutthroat. Uh, people can be on the practice squad one day. They could be on, a, uh, on actual, have an actual roster spot another day. But you may not know if you're going to be in the league or on a team um, each subsequent year. How does that approach the money that you get? Uh, how does that fix your approach rather when it comes to the money that you're getting, the paycheck? What percentage of money are you saving? How are you looking at your financial future during those early years in the NFL? Yeah, thankfully I have a father who's uh, into finance and he's been in finance his whole life. He worked at Citibank in the Bahamas and up in New York and that's why we came to America basically because his job transferred him to the United States of America. Uh, so he was able to help me manage the money, my finances, the investments I made. Uh, the savings that I had so that I lived the same way. I drove the same car. I entered into the NFL with the Tennessee Titans with a Scion PC, and I left with a Scion PC, right? I didn't even upgrade. I, I saved because I knew I wanted to go uh, farther. I wanted to have a house. I wanted to make investments. I wanted to pay for medical school, which is incredibly, you know, expensive for, for a lot of us and, and not to really just be um, plummeted in, in debt, basically. So, yeah, money was important. Uh, having a, a humble lifestyle and, and um, you know, being modest about it and uh, you know it, that's something that I, I took pride in. I said, look man, I'm gonna eat at Waffle House. Uh, it's not it's not probably the most healthy food, but it's cost effective and I love it. Uh, and it's not loose trip every night. Uh, like some of my other teammates are doing. And so having a uh, sensibility and having a little bit of discipline uh, that allowed me to uh, be able to manage my finances as well and set me up for a, a, you know a decent trajectory as we got into medicine and now uh, as a resident here up here in Boston, which is a very expensive city. So I'm glad I was able to be smart with my money back then. All right, so let's get to some of the questions. We have one question from Katie who says, any advice for med students on work-life balance? I wish I could say I learned work-life balance from collegiate sports, but I really just ended up burned out on, out on both school and running. Now, as a med student, I feel like I prioritize my happiness over, over being competitive, which isn't ideal either. How were you able to do both so successfully? Yeah, great question. And, and I certainly share her sentiments, and I've, I've, I've seen that play out, not only with myself, but with, but with others as well. I, for me, what helps me stay moving forward is the constant reminder of uh, why I'm doing this. Like, what's my why? I came from, the United, came from the Bahamas into the United States, where a lot of my cousins and grandparents and uncles and, uh, you know, my godbrothers, they weren't able to do that. Uh, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the access. They didn't have the resources to, to just pick up and leave from our small archipelago and come to America. Uh, my parents did, we got fortunate, we were blessed. And so with that sacrifice came the understanding that I need to repay that sacrifice. I need to repay that. I, I have a debt that's owed. And my repayment comes in the form of 
incredible hard work and stick to itiveness and the ability not to fail. If I fail, it's going to be because I fail. It's not going to be because, you know, somebody else says, oh, I can't do it or, you know, put an obstacle here, an obstacle there. No, no, those won't stop me. It's got to take like an act of, you know, mother nature to stop you from getting to where you want to get to. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the approach I take and uh, managing time, obviously, the practical things, you know, removing distractions, making sure that the people around you are supporting you and helping, keeping your time and make sure it's valuable. Sometimes you have to be a little selfish and say, look, I need some me time. I need to be, make sure that I'm learning this material in medical school, uh, but at the same time, I'm also being able to relax and take a breath. However you recenter yourself, whether it's through prayer, yoga, long walks, reading books, talking to a special loved one, do that. Find that, that groove, find that rhythm, and stay in that lane. And don't let anyone say, oh, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. If it works for you, it works for you. It has, I have found the pace that works for me, and I keep it, I move it, and, uh, and that's been important. Gotcha. We only have just a couple of questions left. Here's from Chloe. Is there anything that you learned during your time pursuing mes medicine that you wish you had earned, learned rather, and applied earlier? Wow. Uh, you know, a very specific question or a very, uh, sorry, a very specific answer that mm -hmm. I give to that would be, um, I wish I had jumped sooner into research. Mm -hmm. I think there are ways to you know, help in medicine through your skill, through your decision making, your critical thinking. Uh, but for me, I, I went from Florida State University College of Medicine, which uh, is a more community based program. And when I got up here to Harvard, I mean, the ivory tower basically, you know, it's research flowing everywhere, resources and people wanting to get studies done and, and ethical approvals for this and studies for that and labs and mice and rats and, and you know, IRBs. I mean, just all these things floating around you. I didn't really expose myself to that. You know, coming up through medicine. So if there are a way that I could have latched on to a neurosurgeon, got into some research earlier, uh, that would have been piqued my curiosity even more. It probably got me a little further ahead than I am now, but I, I'm, I'm happy where I am because I'm moving in the right direction. I'm making it up by, you know, all the patients that I've seen and, and trying to, you know, um, put together their complex pathologies in my mind so that, oh, here's a question that I would like to see answered through a research proposal because I saw you in clinic. I saw your disease, I operated on you, and now I want to do better and I want to sort of help people like you and, and put that out for everyone to sort of learn from it too. So to answer that question very simply, I think if I had jumped into some research a lot earlier, that would have been a, a little bit more helpful for me. And thank you to everyone who were adding the questions. We have one last one for you. Uh, your own foundation is one of a number of efforts that you have uh, outside of your day job, the Myron Roll Foundation. Could you explain the work that you're doing at this time as specifically related to what we're all going through? Yeah, so the Myron L. Roll Foundation was founded uh, when I was an undergrad at Florida State. It's dedicated to serving the underserved in the areas of health, wellness, and education. Uh, we work with foster kids. We work with uh, underprivileged children. We work with Native Americans. We work with Bahamians who are ostracized and marginalized. We do a lot of work in Florida and, and a lot in the Bahamas. But now, with COVID-19, We've uh, uh, dedicated and sent 500 different face masks to um, a mental health clinic in, in Florida, uh, to the Boys and Girls Club up in Boston, here where I am, and then uh, a nursing home, an elderly facility, a uh, long-term living facility uh, in South Jersey where I grew up. So we're just trying to play our part and do our role. Obviously, we can do our part in, in, the, in, in the hospital to directly treating COVID-19 patients, but if our foundation is about service and about finding the least of these and reaching for people who may not be able to help themselves, then this is important for us. And uh, that's what we're, we're pushing and striving to do. Mm -hmm. Dr. Myron Rowe, got to thank you for joining us today. Just a great story that you have. Uh, and thanks to everybody that was watching today as well. You can catch us again next Wednesday. We'll be talking to World Series champion Mark Hamilton, who just graduated from medical school himself. So thank you guys for watching again, and we will see you next time.